I'm Sammy Dessen, and I'm going to be interviewing the author and illustrator of Rad American History A to Z. Let's meet him. Miriam, you go first. Okay. I'm Miriam Kleinstahl. I'm the illustrator of Rad American uh, History A to Z. Here's the book. And um, all of the illustrations in the book are done um, in paper, black paper, um, that's cut out with an X-Acto knife. And I did the backgrounds um, with watercolor. So that's a watercolor background with a paper cut. And um, all the pictures in the book are done with those two processes, watercolor and paper cut. And I'm happy to be here. Thanks, Sammy. Yeah. And I'm Kate Schatz. I am the author of Round American History A to Z. Um, in addition to being a writer, I am an activist and an educator and a parent. And I wrote the book with, with words. I didn't cut stuff out of paper. I, I, just, I just put words on paper. <laughs> All right, I'm going to dive in. Um, either one of you can answer this question. This is very general because I don't know who did all of the work or who did certain parts. So I'm going to start. I did all the pictures and Kate did all the words. <laughs> all right. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll try keeping it nice, but um, you name some of the people you talked with to help write this book and also say that you tapped into your own memories. But what other resources did you use to help uh, inform these stories? How did you research? There's no bibliography. Aha, Sammy, good catch. Now I'll tell you something, Sammy. There is a bibliography. I wrote a very extensive bibliography. It was four pages long because it was all of the books that I used. And then in the very end, we didn't have enough pages to get the bibliography in. So it's actually online at radamericanhistory.com. That was the deal that my editor said, we don't have any more pages. We can't fit it in. Uh, so there's a bibliography online. <laughs> but I really wanted the bibliography to be in because to me, the research process was the most fascinating and exciting research process I've done. Um, the book is an A to Z book of American history, and each letter of the alphabet tells a different story about a moment or movement in American history, most of which are kind of lesser known. Some are going to be familiar to readers, but a lot of them are uh, lesser known, not as familiar, and I tried to dive really deep into each one and, and pull out like fascinating, interesting stuff that most folks uh, haven't encountered before. So in addition to doing a lot of, um, like I mentioned and you said in the intro, I was able to interview a lot of people who were there. So when it was more contemporary history, I interviewed people who'd actually been there. So for A is for Alcatraz, I interviewed one of the people who was an original occupier of Alcatraz in 1969. Um, in some cases, I interviewed the, um, the daughter or the child or granddaughter of someone um, from movement history. So I was able to interview Karen Korematsu about her father, Fred Korematsu. Um, but then I also relied on a lot of scholars and academics um, and, and teachers as well. To, uh, so I'm not a historian. I'm not an expert, I'm just really fascinated by American history. So I turned to the people who make this their life's work, uh, who are experts in the Reconstruction era, experts in the civil rights movement, experts in jazz history, and they really helped um, with, with making sure I had um, deep, accurate knowledge. Miriam, do you wanna talk about your research for the illustrations? Um, yeah, sure. I just, uh, you know, Kate and I, our collaboration is a lot of back and forth with figuring out what stories we want to tell. And then it's kind of my job to give them a, a, a visual look and to try to like capture people that, um, that aren't as inclined to reading, um, and are, are learn more visually. And so I try to make a picture that will also tell the story that Kate is writing. And so um, I used a lot of archival images. Um, sometimes I'd look at videos, um, if there's videos of the movement that we were um, 
trying to portray. And, um, and then I just do kind of a combination of using different source imagery from like archival still images and video and try to make a new image out of those things. All right, that's actually really interesting. Can you elaborate? Um, well, here's a, here's a picture of Dolores Huerta. And, um, and so I wanted, I wanted to have her in the forefront. And then, um, you know, every, all of the stories in this book are really about movements of people, like many people that are working together to make change rather than one individual person. And though um, she's an important and well-loved um, person that, that was uh, really instrumental in bringing about change um, for farm workers in California and, and probably worldwide. Um, uh, it was also the people that took part um, in, in the protests. So I looked at different images and kind of put, you know, put them together for the background there. Does that make sense? Yeah. Actually, that's really interesting. Uh -huh. uh, actually, um, this is just because you were showing the image, A. Uh, we also have this down. Um, how, when, how did you choose uh, when to do watercoloring and when to, like, how did you choose when to add colors and when to keep it more black and white? Um, all of the stories have an image that is watercolor and paper cut together. And then for the longer stories, um, I did additional just black and white paper cuts for the pages, but I use watercolor for every story. Yeah, so like here's another one about um, Q is for quilts. So this is the um, AIDS Memorial quilt in Washington, DC. So the black is cut paper and then the background is watercolor. And then that image ended up as the back of the book. Mm -hmm. so. It's actually really interesting because uh, probably a lot of people are gonna be like, wait, is that watercolor? Mm -hmm. Because I know papers come in different uh, colors. This is the cool part about getting to do an interview where the artist is actually in her home studio where she actually made all the art for the book because you don't usually get to see the actual original art um, in a book. I, I think sometimes people forget when we're looking at an illustrated book, you know, because it's, you know, it's in the book, it's scanned, it's actually, you know, part of the book, we can forget that this is actually a piece of original art. Um, and in the holding it up. Ooh, the real one and the book but, one. <laughs> yeah. The quality is the exact same. <laughs> All right. Um, at the end of each chapter, you list other topics that start with the same letter. Is there a topic that you really wish you could add to the add to the book, but it isn't there? Oh yeah. <laughs> you know, um, Sammy, it's something that we've done in um, most of our other books as well. So in our book, Rad Women Worldwide and Rad Girls Can. I mean. You know, we always have the challenge of how we decide who we write about and which stories we tell. You know, we begin, I probably, can, we probably considered about 200 stories or moments or movements for this book before narrowing it down to about, you know, the 26 or so that are in here. Um, similar for this, our first book, Rad American Women A to Z. It's another A to Z, so there's 26. Um, but for each letter, there were so many more that we could have done. So um, as you pointed out for this book, at the very end of each letter, it says, you know, the letter E is, e is also for. So in this one, E is also for Earth Day. E is also for Ellis Island. It's also for the Endangered Species Act. And it's also for the Equal Rights Amendment. So, um, and, and, and so, you know, yeah, there's a lot of things that I, I, I would have loved to have written about. I don't think I can name just one um, because there's, you know, there's just so many. But that was a nice way for us to get in a little bit of additional history. Um, in our book, Rad Women Worldwide, I remember toward the very end when the book was almost at deadline, uh, this book tells 40 stories from 30 different countries around the world. And I was like, wait a minute, I want to have a big list in the back of the book with a few names of women from almost every single country in the world, and then readers can have their own research process and just go look them up. So 
I stayed up really, really late <laughs> for a couple of nights. And I made this like giant list of almost every country in the world and two or three women, notable women from that country. So I like to think of it in a way, it's like the reader gets to experience maybe a little bit of our research process. So they get to see what it's like. You see the name of someone and you look it up and you see what you find. Yeah, that, that list was really great too for um, our school visits when we went on tour with the Worldwide Book. Um, I remember being at a middle school in, in New York and, and it was a, a school with a lot of um, English language learners um, from a bunch of different countries. And at the end, I remember a bunch of kids coming up and looking in the back of the book and trying to find the, con their, the country they were born in and being so excited that, that their country was included, um, even if a story in the book wasn't from their country. Yeah. Miriam, this question is for you, actually. Um, how did you discover paper cutting? Um, I have a friend, Nikki McClure, who lives up in um, Olympia, Washington, and she's a paper cut artist, and she's been doing um, paper cut calendars for like over 20 years um, that are pretty popular, and she also does children's books. And um, I, I got a commission to do a public art project in Castro Valley, is part of um, Alameda County and I had to do um, about 120 images um, in a pretty short time and Nikki recommended that I try paper cut because you make your drawing on black paper and then you use an exacto knife to cut them it out and then and then the the image is done um, and before I started doing paper cut I was doing printmaking and so I would work a lot in wood where I'd draw, draw a picture on wood and then I'd use a tool to cut out imagery and then I'd have to roll ink onto the wood and then I'd have to put paper on top of it and print it and it was a very long process and so um, paper cut was recommended to me to like have a shorter process and also be able to like pare down the image to have a, like a lot less detail um, which was worked really well for the public art project because the images were cut out of uh, out of stone and embedded into granite, and so um, I had to simplify my drawings as well. And just paper seemed to be a really good um, kind of medium to get me to work fast and also to really simplify and make really bold imagery. You know, really like. In a bold black and white imagery. Um, the Black Lives Matter name has been controversial with some people suggesting that all lives matter. How would you address this? <laughs> uh, all lives will matter. Uh, all lives do matter, um, but only until, uh, or not until uh, black lives and brown lives in this country and around the world are treated equally. Um, so, you know, that's, uh, uh, I like to, our friend Kamau Bell, who's a great comedian and activist, has made the point that, look, nobody was chanting all lives matter before the Black Lives Matter movement began, before the three women uh, coined that term and started that movement. It's not like All Lives Matter was a pre-existing <laughs> movement. Um, so anytime anyone is using that, uh, it's just an attempt to undermine uh, one of the most significant global civil rights movements of our time. So uh, I don't engage in debates about it because to me there's no debate about it. Um, I'm really glad that we have that B is for Black Lives Matter in this book. That was a really important story for us to include. And it's actually one of my favorite illustrations of Miriam's. It's similar to the one that she showed before with Dolores Huerta and the farm workers in the back. Um, in this one, she has the three founders, Opal Tometi, Patrice Cullors, and Alicia Garza. But then in the background, and it's hard to tell, I'm not sure if you can, but it's really multiple generations of activists fighting for racial justice. So she has um, some Black Panthers with the free Huey shirt. She's got some... Uh, contemporary Black Lives Matter teenage protesters, um, and in the back she has some more civil rights era um, and labor workers. So, so rights activists mm -hmm. in there. Yeah. 
So um, yeah, this was a really special story for us to include, and I'm 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 really proud. It's probably one of the stories that I'm the proudest that we we did include. Yeah, I gave that I gave that original art to Alicia Garza, um, who lives here in Oakland. So I can't show it to you, the original. <laughs> Aww. And, and and I'll just add on to what Kate said when when all Black Lives Matter, um, all lives will matter. Yeah. But right now, um, that's not the case. But that's what we're fighting for. Um, another section of your book was M for March. Um, in this, you talk about the Women's March that took place in 2016. Do you think that the Me Too movement and all the marches around the country would have happened if the current president, President Trump, lost that election? <laughs> Sammy, you have really good questions. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's, a, that's a really good question, you know. And so the story um, in this book, M is for March, and there's a few stories in the book. Um, L is for libraries, and J is for jazz, and M is for March, where as the writer, I felt like I didn't want to, it was a chance to tell multiple stories about one kind of thing. So there's several different stories um, about different marches in American history, just as jazz has stories of different um, um, moments in jazz history. And so we did write about, um, about the, actually, I did, we didn't have a full story about the Women's March, um, you know, but, you know, so your question of, of, of would, would the Women's March have happened um, with, without the election of, of Donald Trump or the stolen election of Donald Trump, that particular one, I, I don't know if it would have happened at that exact moment, but I think it's important to know that the Women's March in 2017 was part of a long history of marches for gender equality. Um, in this country, and one of the ones I do write about is the March for Women's Suffrage in 1913, um, which actually was the first big march in American history um, uh, in Washington, D.C. Um, it was the first actual, it was a 1913 suffrage parade, and it was the first big march um, in, in D.C. So would the Women's March have, and, and have gone as it did, when it did, without that, that election? Um, I'm not sure, but there certainly would have been another one at some point. Um, and I definitely believe the Me Too movement, as it happened, would have happened. Because the thing is, Donald Trump um, is, you know, he didn't invent any of this stuff. He's just out there enabling it and supporting it. But misogyny, uh, discrimination, gender-based violence, um, systemic racism, that did not just uh, appear when he uh, when he assumed the presidency in 2016. So all of these movements and, and this activism would have happened um, regardless of him. Yeah, his his um, his behavior though did inspire a lot of people to come out into the streets, especially people who'd never really been active before. Um, and and um, we could certainly say that he was a big wake up call for a lot of um, a lot of people who'd been pretty complacent beforehand. Um, in particular, multi generational too is um, the those those first couple of women's marches were. Um, one thing I noticed was the multi-generations of like kids, moms, grandmas, all coming out together. Mm -hmm. um, also, another chapter you wrote was um, Esper Stonewall. Mm -hmm. um, and um, my understanding is that trans people played a large role in the Stonewall Uprising, but they are often forgotten in the history books. For their important role. Why do you think that is? Hmm. Miriam, you want to start with that one? Uh, well, I think that that two of the women that were really instrumental in bringing about the, the gay liberation movement, uh, Sylvia Rivera and Marsha P. Johnson, um, were also sex workers. And I think it's hard for people to acknowledge that um, that this movement was started, you know, the mainstream um, kind of movement for gay rights um, doesn't always want to acknowledge um, these trans women of color that were really um, re responsible for bringing about radical change for LGBTQ rights in this country. Mm -hmm. um, 
And I, th- I think, yeah. Yeah, that's it. I, I just think that, that their stories have been pushed to the margins because, you know, that they had lack of opportunity um, because of their identity around jobs and housing and really um, were struggling um, for survival and, and some of the only work um, that was available to them was um, sex work. And I think that, that um, some people um, don't want to acknowledge that that, that is a fact <laughs> and, um, or be open about talking about that part of our history. And, um, and so that was important for, for Kate and I to, um, to bring to the story of Stonewall. Um, and there was a film that came out about it that made it seem like it was white people that started um, that rebellion. And it was, that's not based on history. <laughs> no, no. And I think what I would add to Sammy is that I think when we look back um, at the way histories are taught, in particular the way that social movements get kind of presented to the public, there's a lot of ways in which they get very sanitized um, and and that the kind of tellers of history and the history books and, and the movements want to kind of present these marginalized movements and cultures in a way that's most palatable to mainstream America. So for instance, with civil rights history, um, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was an incredible leader. um, And, you know, but the messaging around him gets very kind of uh, made palatable and appropriate for people, right? We don't learn about a lot of the other more radical. I mean, he was quite radical. We don't learn about his kind of radical work as much. Um, We just kind of get the I have a dream version. Um, And I think with Stonewall, it's similar. We get um, have been presented, you know, it was this liberation and it was, you know, mostly, you know, white, good looking men, you know, who, who did it um, when, like you said, in reality, there were trans people, there were a lot of homeless people, there were a lot of youth from the street, a lot of black and brown people, um, a lot of very gender non-conforming people who were not, um, you know, maybe as what mainstream America could accept as much. So we wanted to make sure to highlight them in the story. Yeah, um, there's also just a bit of local history in here that I really love um, on this, this page here of um, these teenagers with brooms was the uh, Vanguard Street Sweepers in San Francisco, and this kind of predated Stonewall, um, where uh, where some city official, I think, Kate, correct me if I'm wrong, was saying we have to get this trash off of Market Street when they were referring to gay youth that were coming to San Francisco. And so um, this group of, of gay youth organized to clean to actually go out and sweep Market Street, the actual trash on the street. And I just thought that was a clever play on words. <laughs> yeah. And showing that, that youth, the youth have always uh, been at the forefront of change as we're seeing locally right now with this um, call for racial justice. A lot of these protests in the last few weeks have been organized by teenagers. Why do you think there isn't a lot of instruction and education about the LGBTQ plus movement in elementary schools and middle schools? Because uh, people are afraid to talk about it. And there is a very deep, deeply rooted homophobia throughout uh, this country. Um, And that trickles down to schools. I think in particular, there's a, I think that there is a, uh, well, there's a lot of things. There's just absolute, uh, straight up homophobia. Um, but I think that there's a way in which um, a lot of parents and educators and people are scared to talk about subjects with young people that are seen as controversial or difficult um, that, or, or not appropriate. And there's a way in which sexuality um, and gender identity uh, is conflated with, with sex, is made into as if it's something that's inappropriate for children to learn about. These are human beings living lives and these are significant political and cultural moments and movements. Um, But there's so much fear, um, so much homophobic fear um, rooted in society that I think a lot of, um, again, parents and educators um, feel that it's not appropriate. You know, luckily we're, I think we're definitely in a shifting time (laughs) um, around that, but that's, I think, uh, definitely at the, at the heart of it. (laughs) Miriam? Well, I I just want to turn it back to Sammy. Have you, 
what about your elementary school and middle school? Like, were you exposed to any queer history? Um, I mean, there were books about it in our library, but there wasn't any lessons about it really or anything. Yeah. But um, there were definitely times where you could tell that teachers were like, I want to teach it, but at the same time, should I? Mm -hmm. Because there's always going to be that time where even if a uh, teacher's like, I want to teach this, sometimes they can't because um, they don't, they can't create a lesson plan around it or they can't do certain things. But there's, but no, I didn't really learn any in um, middle school or current or currently middle school or a few years ago elementary mm -hmm. you know and we still we still live in a in a time in a country where there are still teachers across the country who are fired for being gay and for being out you know let alone actually teaching uh about about queer histories there are people who can you know we we have constitutional protections against you know getting fired because of your sexual identity or your gender identity or your sexual orientation like literally as of last week i mean it's important to me because i have uh two dads and um especially the fact that um i'm i'm happy that he wasn't fired from his job because he used to be a teacher for a very long time he also used to work at visa and um he he didn't get fired which is very good and i mean he wasn't one of the most accepting places but um but it's awful how you can get fired from your job just for being gay or uh, or just being part of the LGBTQ plus community. I mean, that's awful. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I've taught at Berkeley High for the past 25 years, 26 years now. And, um, and I think that things have changed really radically in those 26 years around um, students coming out and students feeling comfortable at school um, and having community at school. There's quite a vibrant GSA and, um, and also a club for non-binary and trans students at Berkeley High, at mm -hmm. least. <laughs> yeah. And you know, Sammy, in the page that Miriam held up from the book um, that says uh, the one with the street sweepers, this section is called Before Stonewall. And it's a bunch of little short um, bits because I wanted to make clear to readers that Stonewall may, is often considered to be where the gay rights movement started, um, but the movement was happening before that. That was kind of just like the big inciting moment that kind of is our flashpoint for it. So I wanted to highlight some examples um, of the decade and few decades before Stonewall um, in 1969. Um, you know, and I write really briefly about one thing was. Um, you know, uh, in the mid 1960s um, and in the early 60s, when the military um, and government were actively rooting out and firing, um, you know, anybody who was even suspected of being gay and lesbian, it was actually called the Lavender Scare, um, and it was a huge sweeping moment where anybody working for the government, again, you didn't even have to be proven that you were gay, would be uh, if you were merely suspected would be fired. And when we think about history, I mean, that's just 55 years ago. You know, that's not that long ago. Um, and I, I think it's important, and I try to do that in the book too, is just make those connections for readers so that when we're thinking about our current moment, when we're thinking about Black Lives Matter, um, we're thinking about police brutality and racial violence, or we're thinking about discrimination, that we need to be connecting them to these moments and movements that were not that long ago. You know, It can sometimes seem like, oh, this stuff happened in the long distance past, but there are many people still alive today who lived through these moments, um, mm -hmm. you know, um, you know, even the, you know, the AIDS epidemic was, you know, in the, I mean, AIDS certainly still exists, but the height of the AIDS crisis was in the 1980s and 90s. That's not that long ago. Um, there are survivors who lived through that. Um, and so, the, you know, these histories are still connected to our present moment. Um, I actually have another question. Um, how important is it for young people such as myself to participate in movements like the ones in your book. To what, I'm, can you repeat it? How important is it to what? How important is it for young people such as myself to participate in movements like the ones in your book? Mm. 
Well, well, like I said before, in almost every movement in this book, um, young people have been at the forefront of fighting for change and continue to. Um, it was that was really evident in in, in the youth climate movement. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'd say um, it is in, incredibly important to care about something. Like that's where I, when young people ask me for kind of advice about activism, like you know, I would start with like I don't think every young person has to be an activist, um, you know, necessarily. I think the most important thing is to start with figuring out what you really care about and what really matters to you, you know, and then you can proceed from there. Um, and when it comes to participating in movements, um, I think that if you care about something, if you have a passion, if you feel moved by all of this stuff happening in the world, it is incredibly important to participate. And I would, I would also say that participation can look like many things, right? There's a lot of demonstrations and marches still happening right now that's not everybody's cup of tea. There's a lot of people who can't be out there because we're still in, uh, you know, COVID is still absolutely a threat, you know? There are so many other ways we can participate. And just by talking about it right now, if, as a young person, you are participating. Like we are in the middle of a, of a historical moment right now. This is what we're going through right now with COVID and the kind of uh, the murder of George Floyd and, and the, the kind of uprising and shift that we're seeing. This will be, if we were writing this book five years from now, we would have included this moment in the book. <laughs> so, you know, even, even by thinking about it and talking about it, you are participating. I also want to just kind of name check our, our book before this book. It was called Rad Girls Can. Oh, yeah. He's going to hold it up. And that's actually all stories of um, girls under 20. And, um, and Kate and I, when we were on tour for that book, um, every place that we went to, there were young people in, in the audience that wanted to tell us about um, something that they've done with mm -hmm. a group of friends to be active. You know, and when we were in Portland, one girl raised her hand and said, me and my friends, um, we got straws and um, disposable utensils banned from our cafeteria at school. And another story in the book was a, a middle schooler who um, who got her period in middle school and there was no tampons or pads at school and she was totally horrified and um, used her allowance to buy um, to make little a little basket to put in the bathroom at school and then finally got the school board to give free sanitary supplies in all of the high schools and middle schools. Um, so there's like little and big ways that young people have activated and always have and probably always will. Mm -hmm. um, Ashley, I've, I've got another question for Stonewall. Um, why, why do you think Stonewall gets the most notoriety? Hmm. Um, I mean, I think in one, because it's, it's easier for us to tell history with, like I say, flashpoints, you know, uh, civil rights, the 1960s, the March on Washington, or the, uh, you know, the, the crossing of the Edmund Pettus, like Sunday, Bloody Sunday and the Ed Edmund Pettus Bridge, you know, or, um, you know, it, when it comes to like war history, like D-Day, right? Like we look at these like specific days or moments that we can build a, our understanding of a history around, um, you know, Stonewall, Oh, it was, again, it wasn't where it all started, but a lot of what came out of Stonewall was really significant for the, the, the next several decades of, of, of kind of like of queer liberation, right? So in the wake of Stonewall, um, you know, a lot of really critical organizations formed, like the Gay Liberation Front, um, the Lavender Menace. Um, and then also one year after Stonewall, so in 1970, um, is when the very first, uh, they called it the Christopher Street Liberation Parade. And it was a parade to commemorate um, what happened at Stonewall one year later. Um, and so that was the first gay pride parade. Um, and the people that organized that stayed together in a coalition and continued to organize pride parades. So I think that's part of it too, that now 
pride and pride, the pride parade is one of the most visible symbols around the world now of, of the gay rights movement, but it is really rooted in and connected to um, the events at Stonewall. And I think also the struggles at Stonewall were happening all around the country where it was illegal to be gay and to like be dancing with somebody of the same gender in an establishment, like you could get arrested for that. And I think police violence um, against the LGBTQ community was happening, you know, all across the country. And we had a similar rebellion in San Francisco at Compton's cafeteria, also pre Stonewall, um, where people just got tired of being harassed by the police and fought back. And I think Stonewall was an example of people standing up and saying, no, we're not going to be criminalized for who we are. And, um, and it, it was such a massive rebellion. I think that's why it, it has gets the attention that it gets and yeah. inspired other people to stand up and say, I'm not going to be criminalized for who I am. I would, I would also add that historically it happened at a moment in time um, that's really significant in our history, right? So it happened in 1969, and it happened kind of at the intersection of the, the anti-war movement, um, the kind of rise of the Black Panthers, and there was this a kind of massive um, kind of social liberation movements happening all over the country. So for a lot of these marginalized groups that were able to kind of come together um, and kind of rise up, they all kind of informed and inspired each other. There's stories of Black Panthers coming down to Greenwich Village um, to kind of support um, during Stonewall. Um, you know, anti-war activists coming in um, to be involved. So there was, you know, it wasn't all totally uh, collaborative, but it was this this moment in time where all of this change and transformation was really happening. Yeah, second wave feminism as well. Mm -hmm. The last question is, you've already touched uh, on this a little throughout our conversation today, uh, but for young people who want to be rad, what advice do you have for them? What are some other resources or books that you recommend? Oh, that's a great question. Miriam, what do we tell young people for how they can be rad? Um, I, like Kate said before, find, like, really search in yourself and find what you're passionate about and then find other people that share your passion and um, join forces. It's always funner in life to not be alone in your room, although we have to be during a global pandemic, but when it's safe to be around community <laughs> again, to, to find your people and, and work together um, to make the change that you want to see. Yeah. And I think that, you know, not being afraid, um, it's one of, it's some of the hardest advice to take, right? It's easy to give, hard to take, but to not be afraid, you know, if you, if you haven't quite found those other people yet, to not be afraid to be the only one who speaks up or, or who stands up to say something. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of conversations right now in this moment about um, about white people and anti how to be actively anti-racist. And, you know, and that goes in for so many ways, being willing to be the one in your group of friends or your class who hears something that's not cool. Here's somebody make a racist joke or a homophobic joke or, uh, you know, people, you know, being sexist and disrespectful, um, being willing to be the one who calls that out um, and, and makes makes it not acceptable. Um, and, and, to be the one who really cares about something and talks about it and tries to get people to pay attention and care. I, I think that that's, that's what makes somebody rad. You have to be willing to take chances. Um, I think a lot of people get really held back by where we all want to do it right. Nobody wants to fail or mess up or get it wrong. And that can really hold us back from so many things, not just activism. It can hold us back from trying the new sport or, you know, taking a, a you know, taking a big risk. But that's, I do feel like, if there's one thing in common that the women and girls that we write about in our, in our books, um, what they really have in common across the centuries and over around the world is that they were willing to take some kind of risk um, based on something that they really believed in and, and, and knew was right. Um, and so that's, um, that's, I think, the kind of core of what it means to be rad. Um, and when it comes to resources, I mean, our books are great. There's so many incredible books out there and so many book lists right now. Um, but I, you know, and I think that also for young people, you know, social media is complicated, right? It can be dangerous and 
kind of suck your brain out and stuff, but it can also be really empowering. It is such a powerful source of information. Um, it can be a powerful source of activism. We look at the story just from yesterday about Donald Trump's rally getting getting punked by TikTok users and K-pop fans. <laughs> I mean, there's a lot of uh, <laughs> there's a lot of um, good that can come. So figuring out how to use social media in ways that are um, you know empowering and informative, I think that's a space where people can and you can make those connections that maybe we can't make uh, in real life these days. Um. Actually, um, I have one more thing left. Great. Um, what was your favorite? Um, sorry, I have to find this. Uh, what was your favorite uh, paper cup? Hmm. In this new book. Yeah. Miriam, what's your favorite one? Um, probably the Black Lives Matter one. Yeah, that's that's also my favorite. So since we both said the same one, I will go to another one that I really love. You know, I really love the one that she did for O, which is for Our Bodies, Ourselves, because um, this is actually a paper cut that she did of a book cover, of a very particularly iconic book cover. And actually, oh, I don't have the book here. It's in the office. But, uh, that's oh, special, too. That's our favorite. Okay. <laughs> so... For the letter X, instead of doing a movement, movement or moment that starts with X, Miriam did, and it's hard to see, a big X. And we wanted it to look like, uh, as you can see, it looks like binder paper, like a notebook paper. So our idea was that it's what our history notebooks looked like when we were in high school, and we were bored in history class, and it's full of doodles of all the things we wish we'd been taught when we were in school. <laughs> so... You know, it has a. It says the name Bayard Rustin with a heart around it, and next to it, it says the 1963 March on Washington was organized by an openly gay man. So there's another part of American history and LGBTQ and civil rights history that we don't often learn about. Um, it's got lists of books that we think people should read and that we read in high school. So I'd say, yeah, that's kind of the favorite. But you have to get the book to and look closely at it to know what else is on there. Um. Well, uh, thank you so much for doing this. It was a wonderful time to be interviewing you. Thank um, you. Thank you did so a much. wonderful job. Thank you. Thank you so much for doing this interview. Um, I mean, I guess this is it for now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, Sammy. Really, uh, you know, we get interviewed a lot, and um, I think people kind of ask us the same questions over and over again. So you really showed that you paid attention to the book, and I found these questions to be very insightful and thoughtful. So this is much appreciated. Yeah, I, ho I hope you have a good uh, eighth grade year coming up, Sammy, and, and um, my best hope is that you get to start high school in person. <laughs> thank you so much. Have a wonderful day, life, and year. Okay. I like it. Hey, Miriam Kleinstall here. Gonna to show you how to do a paper cut today with, uh, I'm gonna use black paper. You can use any color paper that you want, but what you'll need is to start out with a piece of paper. We're gonna make a drawing on it, and then we're gonna cut it out with an X-Acto knife. So you need an X-Acto knife and something to cut on, a self-healing pad. Um, this is a piece of cut paper, and one thing you'll notice is that all of the pieces are still connected. So it's still intact as one piece of paper, but we cut out the spaces that we want the color to be behind it. So this is the young Ruby Bridges being escorted into school by the National Guard. Um, this is a paper cut of the writer Anne Frank. And one thing you'll notice, again, to keep it all connected, is that her eyebrows are attached over to this, her hairline, which obviously her eyebrow didn't go all the way over, but if I had cut that out, her whole face would have fallen out. So as you're drawing uh, for your paper cut, you have to figure out how to keep it all connected. And then I cut in black paper and often glue to a lighter piece of paper. But lately I've also been making watercolor backgrounds. So this is a paper cut of Dolores Huerta 
glued onto white paper and then I did a watercolor behind it. This is a paper cut of uh, the Names Project of the AIDS quilt uh, displayed in Washington DC with watercolor behind for all of the color. So um, that's an option. Or um, I also like just how they look as paper cuts. So today I'm gonna cut out the poet Adrian Rich, who's one of my favorite poets. So I have the image up here on my computer to look at and I'm working on making this drawing. So um, I'm just putting in the last touches of some little highlights for her hair in here. And, um, and I'm about to start cutting it with my blade. So the original picture didn't have her shoulders in it, but I wanted to put them in, so I just kind of made up a shirt for her. I'm gonna use a X-Acto knife. This is a, just a basic X-Acto blade with a number 11 blade. Um, most houses probably have something to cut with, some sort of blade. And then this is, this is a cutting mat that a lot of people have that you can get in art stores. I like to use this one so because it's a white background so I can see what I'm doing a little better. So the first thing I'm gonna do is just start cutting out around the outline that I made of Audrey and Rich. And if you haven't read her poetry, I recommend it. She's one of my all time favorite poets. So I'm just cutting around the perimeter around the outside of this whole composition. And this is a good way to start for you all at home, just to get the feeling of the blade. So that's that part. And then I like to just go right into the face. And I, for some reason, always start with the forehead and I'm cutting out the hairline here. And once you cut a piece out, take it all the way out so you can see what you got. Another trick that I do is that I flipped the draw the image on the computer that I drew backwards and drew it on the paper backwards. So on my final paper cut, um, it'll be nice and clean on that side and you won't see all of my pencil marks. So that's one thing you can do if you have the technology to do that. Otherwise, you just draw it and erase your pencil later. So as you can see, as I'm cutting, I'm just taking parts out so I can see what I've got. And you can take your time. I'm just going kind of quick here so you can see a final cut in not too long. And you can see with my hand I'm not cutting with, I hold pieces down um, so that the paper doesn't move around too much as I'm cutting. So you're actually being pretty active with both hands, both your cutting hand and your hand that's not cutting is being a helper by holding paper down for you. Instead of cutting out individual teeth, I like to cut out just a big white shape because, I don't know, teeth end up looking weird when they have little spots cut out. <laughs> she has a little earring in, so I'm gonna cut out this little hoop. And 
and then I'm going to cut out a really thin line around it. Um, so now I'm working on the shirt and I'm just putting a few little details in here. I decided to leave the shirt mostly black. Um, I think it looks better high contrast like that than if I did the shirt light. So, um, and again, the, the original picture of Audrey and Rich didn't have the shirt in it. So I just kind of made it up because I thought it would look better with shoulders. And I'm getting pretty close here to where I want it to be. Another highlight in the hair maybe. What do you think, studio assistant? Does it need anything else? I, I see the part I forgot. Um, above your eye, there's like a little line often. Um, this is really hard to cut out. So I'm cutting the tiniest little line that's above your top eyelid. And I'm gonna do one on this side too. Kind of holding my breath when I'm doing this cut because this is really fine little line. That looks better, doesn't it? So I think. So I think that's done. Um, if you make your own paper cut, that'd be great. If you post it and then hashtag made with Miriam. Okay, thanks. See you later.